Well, here we are, beginning, bare beginning of a third year, and uh, Mr. Producer decided we needed a different look. So here we are sitting opposite side, uh, camera on the opposite side of me, um, and uh, happy lights in the background. Who knows? Let's see how this works, <laughs> works out. It's a lot of fun. Um, but before I start, um, let me um, thank uh, Doug A., Benjamin C., Douglas M and Ray, Ray L A, etc., uh, for your kind donations uh, uh, just before this um, recording. All right, so much appreciated. So so much of a benefit um, to everybody. You know what you're doing is um, just as much enabling as what I'm doing. You know when you do this, uh, and so we are. We are holding our own for this year, and uh, thank you very much. Um, so, um, what I'm doing is something a little different now, and uh, as I promised you in this last uh, uh, blog message, whatever we call that, is um, I'm going to actually do a series. And you can see that I've called it The Habits of Highly Effective Impressionists. Now, that's just being a little silly, but there was a book or two, maybe a couple different books on uh, the seven habits of highly effective people or something. And uh, I don't, I didn't have that in mind at all. It's just, I, I was talking to a student the other day and I noticed that he had, he had a, sort of a curious mixture of habits. And you'll understand what I mean when I give you this first group. But what I'm going to do is a series I'm probably going to try to dress more or less the same for this series. I think I will try to dress the same for this series. And so you can find them easily enough visually if you have no other way. And uh, I'm just going, to, just going to address aspects of it. An idea of uh, uh, just for the start, you know, would be like, what are your goals in the start of a painting? And, uh, and so this is all about that kind of thinking and the, dis and the subsequent disciplines that are involved to get you good results as a person who's painting uh, what we call a lowercase i impressionist. If you want to find a, mo a definition of that, go look at Gemmel's. I want to tell you what's in the twilight of painting. I'm sure it is. Uh, and if you want, and that book can be found online. It's worthwhile. Gemmel, R. H. Ives Gemmel was my was my um, uh, primary mentor, uh, the most significant mentor uh, I had in painting, and um, he did a lot of work uh, by way of book and. and um, and of course, the work he did with us as students to um, to clarify as much as he could, because he had had to dig in himself, uh, dig in, try to dig up all the stuff that he found. Even his generation had been lost, and he was, you know, he wasn't trying to become an impressionist. He was taught by impressionists, but um, he was trying to be an imaginative painter. Which, if you can see the difference, the imaginative painter is the one who's painting pictures he's made up in his head. His storylines, illustrators are, are in that class typically. And uh, but the uh, but a portrait painter, for example, is what we call an impressionist. Somebody's just painting somebody just as they sit there, and the color and everything, uh, the setting, all that stuff is painted to do exactly what it does in nature. And uh, so Gamble had different motives, and he was saying he, he couldn't find that information. He was already uh, you know into the twenties. Nineteen twenties, nineteen teens, and uh, he was in Europe. He was not finding what he needed, and uh, some of that he blames on himself. But that's, I guess, neither here nor there. But my point is um, that there's a body of thinking that goes with this, and you can tell whether you're in the impressionist mode or if you're in a another mode. And I'm going to call the other mode the thinking mode. You know. So the thinking, now, if you follow the idea we've already talked about before, that when I stop thinking, I stop painting on, on the one hand. There's always thinking for all painters. But as an impressionist, you have to be out of your mind. And what that means is in, your, in, your, in the values and the colors and all those things. So um, anyway, but you begin to see that that's already one of those, as it were, mindsets uh, ways of thinking, disciplines, you know, these are the kinds of things we're talking about. Eventually, you can just sort of look over your shoulder as you're painting, and you can see if you keep switching on and off into different kinds of, being different kinds of painters. And you'll find the consistency, the impressionist consistency, the naive eye, for example, and all those things. 
pays off. So I'm just going to give you a tiny couple lead-in things um, uh, to talk about this. Let me say one thing before I start, and that is that, as I said, looking over your shoulder. So if you're painting away, painting away, you'll start noticing what, how your thinking is. Notice your thinking. And um, so if you find yourself, what I would say, thinking behind your ears, behind your eyes, if you're thinking in your head, stuff you know. Gamble said once, uh, this person doesn't see with his eyes, he sees with his ears what people have told him. Now, that's an interesting and what we'd call dangerous moment for the Impressionist, right? <laughs> so, um, but let me jump to a couple, make a couple of points. First of all, we've already addressed before that you need to have a list of the elements. And I just say, so you need to already know names, right? So that's one of those fundamentals of being a good Impressionist. The names of things we work with. What do we work with? Not anatomy. We work with color, with values, with intensity, with with angles, with uh, shape, you know, all form, light effects. You understand? That's our list of things. Here's It's up on the screen. Now I'm going to jump to the second point, and that is we have to have skills, very particular skills. And you've got to develop these skills. You will do it over time as you try to paint what's in front of you, right? And these are the, some of the skills, and this isn't trying to be exhaustive. This isn't where I'm trying to work today uh, in this in this series. But you need skills, basic skills, like making value and color gradations, like to make, a, to make a, a value gradation go from darker to lighter at the right speed, so that between this distance and the, between here and here, it, it transitions properly, so it's the different value when it gets down to here. Uh, color, the same thing. Uh, adjusting uh, or truing color notes, right? So you have to have the ability to hit a note and then adjust it till it's right to other notes. That's a very basic thing you have to be skilled at doing. Uh, you have to be able to create a light effect. And the light effect, we, by, by that, we just mean you have to be able to get your value contrast plus the edge sharpness where these, where these contrasting values meet and have it produce that thing we call a light effect <laughs> and then get the series of those effects right to each other, okay? That's a skill you have to have, right? Uh, you have to be able to make wet on dry joints. Uh, joints meaning where you have, where you add paint the second day, third day, you have to be, where you put... Make, you're going to adjust a note or, or add add to an area, begin to more, bring more features into the face, the, the head being dry already, uh, when you start doing that, you have to be able to put those features in, either painting the whole head out fully wet, which leaves you a joint on the canvas between the background and the head, which is a wet on dry joint. Or if you're putting features into a wet head, right, into a dry, into a head that's already set and dry, which you can do, you have to repaint the whole head every time you do it, <laughs> Uh, but you can. And, uh, but um, if you don't, then you have to be able to adjust. You see, you have to be able to efficiently get through a painting. And if you keep painting out entire areas all over again, you're not going to efficiently get through a painting. So you have to be able to do parts and uh, be able to tie them on so they look like they're of a piece with the rest. Let's just You can't see where there's a separation, and that's a wet on dry joint. You have to be able to correct areas, um, and this is the new list here, and tie them back on invisibly. That's what I'm saying. And then you have to say things like using the right amount of paint. And that's a kind of a classic discussion, but you have to work with that and figure out what it is. You'll notice if you use paint that's too thick, it, it limits your ability. If you use it too thin, it limits your ability to do certain things, to achieve certain um, um, visual uh, effects, truths, you know, relationships. So, all right, so now let's get on with the first of our set. And this is the series, this, the subtitle of this one is called The Visual, Not the Actual. This is, a, this is from a, a note from uh, Mr. Gamel that was passed on to me by Tom Dunley, and I, I have to beg his forgiveness for not remembering that, that he was my source for that. But um, it was handwritten by Gamel. And um, I would, I'd like to show you a facsimile of it. It, it was kind of delightful uh, in his 80-year-old writing, 80-year-old man's pen, you know, <laughs> hand. Uh, but, the, um, but the visual, not the actual, uh, is, is the whole discussion about what we're doing is we're painting what we see, not what we, that's say what we see, the, f the effects, the things that hit our retina and as they do, as they hit our retina. So that's why I said the list, color values and all those things, that's all we can see. But the actual, you're saying, well, that's a dog, that's a nose, that's a this and that's a that. The actual will be your enemy. You know, you're not painting noses, right? We're just moving colors around. So if you could keep that model in your head, but as a purist, so to speak, an impressionist, you'll find that there's a need to go ahead and, um, um, I don't know why I put that picture in there, but there you are, have enjoy. 
<laughs> I said, we're probably going to come back to this. So these are the things that you have to have in your makeup. And understand this is going to become more and more fascinating once you realize that what we're doing. But, um, but you have to be able to understand the base elements like value chroma and hue of a note, right? So that's all we were saying before. That's that list. So that's a basic thing, though. You have to have understanding of what we mean by all those things. And you have to have an ability to do things with them, but to understand that well, that's the base elements we work with, right? So we wouldn't have any painting at all if it weren't for values, right? The values is by far the most primary thing. It's black and white. It's dark and light that make up the world visual, right? The parts that you can see. If all the values were the same, it'd be much more difficult to see the world, to see, the, 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 to see me sitting here and the stuff around. By the, by the way, looking at the stuff around, these are all, what is this, John Adams and all these sort of books. This is, this is the part of my library that usually has nothing to do with painting, and I'm going to probably move in and out painting books in here so you can enjoy reading what those titles are. Uh, but for today, we're doing what we're doing. Um, so, so you see part two, second one, thinking not about what the thing we are painting is, but thinking only about what a value, angle, etc., is doing in relation to other such elements. Do you understand that if you're doing anything but that, you're not in this mindset? So you have to become disciplined to do that. You have to be, your thoughts, as I said, it has to be all in front of your eyes. All your thinking goes on with what's going here, what's happening here, what's happening here, what's happening here. Do you follow me? So entirely. So then what you're interested in when you say, when I say, so what are these things doing? What it means is what are they doing in relation to each other? So we'd say what the dark is dark and the lightest light are. And then you would say, you'd bring in a third value and you'd, you'd try to place it and you'd, so that it would do what it did in relation to the lightest light and dark, darkest dark. So it would appear to land in this right place, right? So it's doing, one of the things you might say it's doing, that middle tone is, is, is tending toward the light side or if it was tending toward the dark side. Those are some of the things you would say it's doing. But for example, a red and another red, you'd say this red is more has more blue than this red. This is the orange or the warmer red. This is the more neutral red. That's what it's doing. These are the actions that are going on. So you have to be able to adjust to those things. So we're just doing colors and then we do what they do. We correct what they do in relation to the other ones, okay? So thinking about what's before you in your eyes now and not what you know. And that was the point I was just making, right? Oh, well, let me say that, but then there's this follow-up. And so not what you know, what's before you in your eyes now, not what you know. So even when you're painting an Impressionist painting, you aren't thinking about what you learned in the last painting. You just in this, you're in this moment right here, right here, this is it, stay within this frame. And let each painting, let each painting, this each new painting be today's eye, today is, is, is the total context, is the, is the total content. You're not something you know. Now, you, well, as you're painting, of course, you'll, you'll, you will apply knowledge. You'll have learned to hit notes better. You'll, you'll have learned to ask better questions, for example. All the kinds of things we'll talk about pretty soon. And then there's a couple more points. Uh, yeah, I'm Joy Shoy gives the... Um, these two I like. This is a, tar a tarbell, and the one two up was a um, uh, Joseph de Camp. I wonder if I can find a little better color version of that. Uh, but you follow, though, that what I'm showing you here are the um, two examples of the kind of painting that we're talking about. And um, so if I were saying to you, uh, what are the base elements here? Let me see if I can get my laser going. You would say, OK, here's red. Here's a color red. And, and it's value such and such. So it's color red. This down here, this is color blue, shall we say. And you're, you obviously have to be aware of the color, right? The red, yellow, blue thing. Well, there's darks. Here's your dark, here's your dark, there's your dark. And these three darks, shall we say, are going to be each of probably or typically of slightly different value, uh, different uh, intensities. Uh, yeah, well, intensities and colors. In a typical, in a, in a typical uh, painting by these guys, you'll see color in the shadows. That's just one of the sources of the atmosphere. These won't be inky blacks, even though they may appear that, so here. That's a different discussion. I've got to stay simple here. But you understand, though, that then um, uh, you have um, uh, the ideas of contrast, for example. These are the things you're naming. So the amount of contrast here in our world and the amount of contrast here, these, these are the kinds of things you're going to wind up thinking about. These are the phenomena of our world. 
Now, proportion is just as much a phenomenon of our world as it is in any other one, but here's the top of the head. Here's the piece of the elbow that, that reads, we can measure with, and you get all the way down to here, and this to this, to this has to be right, or to any other thing that reads. All these linear proportions have to be correctly aligned, obviously. Uh, so proportions don't go anywhere. That's one of the named items. So, um, and I was talking about the idea of transitions. You have to be able to do transitions. And in the cheek here, you'll see the values transition to create the form. The transition, you see it's going from, from a dark, from the shadow mass to the shadow line and then turns into a midtone and then gets lighter as it goes, right? And it's simultaneously it's changing colors. And you can noticeably see the color going from pinkier on the cheek down into something cooler down below and as and, and, and again moving in value too. So that's the idea of gradations and you can see that typically this painting uh, I believe has a better value movement in the walls too. So we just talk about pure color color slash value movements. These are things you have to be skilled at. Um, but the idea of a sharp edge, you have to be able to do a sharp edge. There, this, you know, this sharp edge is different from these. You have to be able to articulate a sharp edge. The edges aren't all the same. And, uh, and when and how to do that is going to be a big part of what happens for a painter. But the wet into wet edge, that's one thing that we, uh, you have to be skilled at. And then the second thing that we talked about before is the wet on dry edge. So if you decide you need to move the nose over on a different day, you decide it needs to be just a touch to the right, you want to move it into the gray area there and and recreate that area. And you'll have to recreate the joints, shall we say, the wet and dry joints on both sides of the nose. And that's what I'm talking about. It's a skill. It's just, these are very basic skills you want to be good at. And that's why this painting was up there. And I forgot to, to mention these things. Um, yeah, so it's just that kind of thing. You also, Well, yeah, we're going to go through a lot of this stuff as time goes by. So let me go away from that. So let's go to the next group, and that is this last two items I'm going to make here. These are trying to be relatively short. This will be the longest one I'm betting, but if not, we'll, we'll see where we are. I was trying to keep it under 20 minutes, uh, but I'm not going to rush it uh, on advice of Mr. Uh, Producer. So you have to be able to see the ensemble without depth. This is a fundamental skill. There is no in. There is just a skin. So when you look at me sitting here, you don't have to see in. Some of you guys with really good eyes just automatically go zooming in, zooming out, zooming in. This is from front, that's in back. But to be an interpreter, the way that God talks about it, you actually have to, to be able to see this as a skin. Just color note, color note, color note, color note, color note. No in, no out. You can't, that's the kind of thinking, that kind of knowledge does not help. In fact, it impedes the accuracy of your value notes. If everything is just values and colors, you can do this. Okay? That's the gift. So, uh, especially if, you know, so this idea of flat, I was going to say, especially if you already know that all you can paint is color values, right? So, uh, but the idea of flat is a huge thing. You have to be able to see the thing as if we're two-dimensional. There's a picture plane and nothing, as De Camp specifically said, don't look past the picture plane. So if you're painting me at such and such a size where the truth of my sizes would be right for a picture that sat, picture plane that was this far away from me, everything on that plane, everything on there would be proportional left and right. And then there, and by the way, there's no thinking in. You don't have to try to figure out how, how wide the thing looks or anything like that. You just have to make sure you're disciplined about staying on the flat. Fundamental thinking and discipline of our way of painting. So like a two-dimensional, seeing two-dimensional and not three-dimensional geometry. So someone recently in one of the blogs was talking about uh, how, how um, uh, Bridgman helps you to see the three-dimensional geometry, and this one person was talking about three-dimensional. The Impressionist doesn't care. The Impressionist doesn't want to know, rather. What the skill is, this point-angle skill, the geometry we're talking about is flat. If the, if the world is seen as flat, then all the geometry is flat. There's no in geometry. So there's just color values, and there's where they land in relation to each other on this, on this plane. There's no in. There's no in. You don't have to go back there and figure out anything. You just watch this plane, reduce it to flat in your mind, a skill, a fundamental skill, right? And reduce it to flat and keep staying there. Okay, that's the, the hard part of this. Can you, can you stay there? I suggest to you, if you'll try to do this and really stay there one time, it'll get so fixed in your mind that as you go along, if you start falling away from it, you'll start realizing 
that if you go back to it, you're going to get, become more accurate much more rapidly. You're going to be able to correct pictures more rapidly. So, so, but the geometry, you know, rather than three-dimensional, is just a triangle or a box and, you know, a diamond or whatever. And there's points that I, that I, you know, the way the lights are configured in here, going down to maybe more my hand is sitting, you can see a triangle, you know, things like that or box, whatever. And those are the, those, these are the geometries without which you can't work in, in painting. You actually have to be able to do this as an impressionist. Not the other one, but you have to be able to do this. All right, so I'm going to stop at that one. Uh, let's see if I can, I, I won't stop yet. I'm going to go back and just see, the, look at this picture here and just talk about this idea of seeing without depth, okay? So this picture has already in his mind been reduced to flat. But you're saying, no, I can see trees far away. Isn't that amazing? And that's the gift. This is the gift that keeps on giving. And this is that, where that phrase comes from. He stuck in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, what a good boy am I. That Gamble, Gamble would throw that on you. And it, if you, it basically means that if you get the colors in the right place on the canvas, in the right size, in the right intensity, and other things in relation to each other, that you will have that look. You'll have that three-dimensional look. It'll be your gift. And so it's going to go for you through this whole process. All right. Um, so that's the flat, and so let me just show on here too as well the, the, the idea of, so here's the point edge of this, of this um, pond. We, not that we're naming ponds, but we find this point because there's a sharp little point in the middle of the picture that you, read, you can read well. And this thing has to be correct in angle, by angle, to any other notable spots out there. So parts of trees that read, you know, something that's useful, some, some point. All these things are trying to relate and try, so that's the idea of the of the um, of the geometry. So you could even see that there's a line. This goes to this goes. This is a long line here, and you could see it. Other sets of points here forming a V or a triangle. That's not a particularly good one, but it gets the idea across to you. So all right, let's stop at that for this one, and and uh, and I hope you're not so turned off you won't ever come back. But this is that series then it's going to get more and more obvious immediately in the next one that we do, okay? So let me just thank you once again for your kind uh, donations. Um, as we said, one of the reasons we did this, uh, we're, we're doing this series, is a thank you uh, that for, the, for all of you who have been subscribing and, uh, and sharing and commenting and all that sort of stuff that's gotten us to this, you know, 9,000 plus subscriber level, a really, really amazing, wonderful mark for us. Um, so just wanted to thank you again, and, uh, and we'll see you in the next one.